common sort of materials, and it uses complexity to get function. And so this is a good example. Um, you guys ever seen a Venus flower basket? So this is a sea sponge, and they grow about this big, and it's woven, um, that's actually, that's glass. Those are glass fibers that it grows into this intricate structure right here. And those glass fibers, you, you can bend, you can wrap them around your finger. Um, you can, they're optical, so if you shine a light in one end, you know, it'll shine through and shine out the, the, the other. And to me, this just blew my mind as a sort of a biologist. How could something at sea temperature grow this? And could, could we eventually just get to a point where we, where we have a bucket and we squirt some gel in there and it grows a glass sculpture or something? I don't know. Um, and the answer is maybe, but we're not there yet. Um, I, I also studied the abalone shell and how, um, well, I want to tell you, oh, okay, I'll tell you. The abalone shell, so this is that mother of pearl that you see. And if you turn over oyster shells or other things, you can often see it as well. Um, and how this is created is with proteins. And how the, the glass uh, fibers are, are created is with proteins as well. So the way that this is created is uh, one of the cells will make a little like brick of calcium carbonate or aragonite, which is what the, the, uh, the shell is now in. And then there'll be some proteins that come along and sit on the edge and grind down the edges. And so some pro proteins will find the middle of it and drill a hole through it. And some proteins, so you have proteins that will literally do different like tool tasks to that brick to get it to the shape that it uses to then stack. So it's kind of amazing. The way that the glass one works is it's just a, a glass, it, it, it makes this protein thread, and then it literally takes the precursors of glass, the silica and, and the oxide atoms, and puts them in the right position to form glass right on its surface. And it does that throughout the entire surface. So it basically it coats itself in glass. Um, so there's no furnace, there's no oven, it does it just at its own temperature. It just by being really, by cozying up in the right way, it can get caught. Um, so that's pretty clever. Um, and in, for years and years and years, we were talking about the way we make things is we, we do heat, beat, and treat. Like what's the, how hot do you get it? What, how, what do you treat it with? What, what, what acids do you use? How much do you hit it? What, you know, where is it? And that's how you make ma materials. But the way life makes it is very different. It's how do you get complexity? How do you be soft? How do you, uh, how do you mold to the right shape? And, do it on the nano scale. And so protein is really life's tool set for making things. That's what every organism uses, is pro protein to make things. So your bones, your teeth, they're not made out of protein, but proteins made them. And so if we want to learn how to craft things the way that nature does, uh, we've got to get good at using proteins. And that's something that we're not very good on the craft level. Uh, we don't really know how to do that. And for years, um, I worked with biologists and material scientists. We were trying to figure out what's the what's the te technology that's going to ta take us forward. How are we going to do, do 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 this? And silk kind of has bubbled up to the top as a really good one to think about. A really good good, good one to, look, to to really study. And this is the silk that I have here. This is the sort of the silk that everybody's sort of familiar with. But the silk that we're going to talk about today is this stuff. So. Actually, I tried to get some ready for you guys, but I messed up, and so it's kind of goopy. Um, uh, I didn't quite get it right, and so that's a good example. But um, so the way that that this is advanced in the labs is people have been studying silk in like optical silk. So he, he made this little. Um, you can see it; it's kind of like a clear piece of plastic. Um, and I have an example here. So this is silk. But it's in, you know, kind of, I've been kind of torturing it. Um, I also do weird experiments by adding things to it and make like brown versions. But, um, so silk can be this optical thing that you can make things with. You, like they're making holograms with, with it. So they can pattern silk on the nan nano scale to create these nano optical arrays, um, which can be used in drug discovery sensors, things like that, where uh, you might want to um, have a specific control over um, 
over the optics. So it turns out to be a, a good one. In the lab, they're also doing tissue scaffolds. So silk is biocompatible. It works in your body. Um, you can implant it in your body, won't reject it, it'll grow onto it. And so it's a good scaffold for you know, those things like organ transplants or replacement parts. Um, they're now doing, I just read something about they're using silk for uh, not knee replacement, but actually fixing the cartilage in the knee with a silk uh, cartilage mimic that then your body grows back to. And so it's a whole new way of approaching knee repair. Um, so it's a big deal in the labs. These are all sort of, there are silk electronics. So you can make actual, um, this is a, this is an antenna. So this is a silk an antenna that you can put in someone's bot body and it will biodegrade. Um, so they, what they wanted to do is do like a silk tattoo or they would implant it and then you could tell whenever that person walked by with like a cell phone or something. Like you, could, you can do weird, weird things with it. But your body, these are all, um, I think this is magnesium or something uh, that your body might need anyway. And so it all just dissolves in your body and they just, it's a non-toxic silk electronics. But one of the coolest things that we can do with silk is sort of add biological activity to our materials. So uh, people have started making things like gloves that you could touch a, a surface and it would say, you know, contaminated on it because what you can do with silk that you can't do with other things is theoretically this is a liquid and it goes to a solid and that transition doesn't require any heat, it just, it just is uh, dehumidification. So as it dries out, it turns into that film. So it, it goes from a, a liquid to a, a solid, and silk plays nicely with enzymes and other biological materials. So you can, you can start to put biological things into the silk, and, um, and it, you'll, you'll then have a hard surface that will have active enzymes on it, which we haven't been able to do with any other technology before. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're, they're using that uh, for like drug release things where you could, you can actually get silk so it'll degrade over time or it'll degrade when it senses just the right thing. Um, so they're now doing all kinds of clinical studies with that. Um, it plays well with the world, like 100% biodegradable. Technically, it's edible. The process does use some um, salts that aren't really super fun to eat, but it's not, it's not something that's going to kill you. So it's, it's edible, sort of. Um, there's there's um, this um, material called shrilk, which is a silk and a keratin. No, silk and a chitin. So you take um, crab shells or shrimp shells, and you break that down and you combine it with this stuff, like the powder and the silk together. Silk binds really well to these other polymers and you can create new kinds of material. material. So shrilk, I made something with cellulose and, and silk. Um, it just plays well with other kinds of materials to make these interesting sort of composites that have new, new properties. So um, I'm not the only one, but a lot of people think silk is the ideal protein for the next wave of sort of the sustainable bio-integrated processing. And all those examples were really high-tech, um, but I'm actually, what I'm really excited about is the DIY sort of potential of it, and, and it's really not, if you can cook, if you can cook a souffle, you can definitely make this, which is, it's not that hard. It's really just boiling and a couple of steps of moving things around, uh, measuring a, a little bit here and there, and uh, that's it. Um, and I'll go through the process. So I think it's, it's this whole idea called silk smithing is something I'm trying to promote. I'm trying to get Barn to sign up to like, let's have a silk smith lab uh, or station or something where we can uh, smith away. Um, and so silk smithing is just this, uh, this word that I think captures that idea of you're like a blacksmith or you know, somebody who can make those things out of that material. You can make all these new things out of silk. So really broadly, like raw silk processing is where I've been spending a lot of my time. 
Prototyping materials is where I'd like to get to soon, and design applications, I think, is down the road. Uh, we sort of brainstormed a little bit here, uh, but, but and so this is where, where I've been spending my time, and this is what I can teach people how to do. Um, uh, so for example, for about $2,000, I set up a silk lab. So it's just basically all the things that are on this list. You need some cocoons, some tubes, some little wave boats, um, and I can send this out to anybody who wants it, or you can come over and visit my garage. Um, lithium bromide, gloves, protective equipment, scissors to cut these things up, stir bar, hot plate, balance. So there's not there's a, a centrifuge which is optional. I've actually never used it, but um, I have one sitting around. So and that was the most expensive thing. So you, you can probably get a lot cheaper uh, 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 lab than I made. So it's, this is not a lot of stuff, right? Like, your kitchen has most of those things. Um, so the chemicals that, the only kind of chemicals that, that you use are um, sodium uh, carbonate, sodium, chlor sodium carbonate, and lithium bromide. Lithium bro 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 bromide is the one that I'm most concerned about. Um, both of them, are, uh, neither one is, if you've ever made soap and worked with lye, it's at that pH level. And so you just, you wouldn't want to spill it. It might not be for kids at that point, but you would, um, but you have to be careful with what you do, but it's definitely within the realm of DIY. You know, if you handle anything that's remotely. <laughs> yes, <laughs> with centrifuges, you're fine. Um, so the steps are pretty easy. You cut the cocoons, you boil them. I just boil them um, in, I just have a hot plate sitting there. Um, and a stir bar, which is a fun little, um, if you're not ever familiar with the lab, you can get to watch it spin, spin around. Um, and then the most expensive part is actually buying the dialysis bags. So dialysis is when you, or these bags are basically, they're just, the, they, they look like Ziploc bags, and they're surrounded in a little pink plastic part, and you, uh, you just inject the protein in, into them. And what they are is they're, they're just a plastic membrane that has really tiny holes that lets the lithium bromide out and water in, but doesn't let the silk protein out. And so that way you're able to, to purify the silk pro, pro, pro protein away from the lithium bromide. Um, and that's, the, that's the, the trickiest step, and that takes a couple days. Um, this is actually in lithium bromide right now, because um, it's too thick to get into the dialysis bag. So I'm kind of stuck at that point. That's what, yeah. Yeah, totally. If you have the right pore size, um, and you just let it, because uh, it's just um, diffusing across the membrane. That's all it's doing. Um, Can I ask how many cocoons it takes to get that quantity that you have in the tube there? About 15. That's not many? Yeah. Not that bad. Um, yeah, so we, you can just cut them up and you do them and... Um, you know, at some point, if people are interested, we could we could we could start doing that. If anybody wants to cut stuff up or anything, more than welcome to. Um, we can make some stuff for you. It takes about the whole process does take about four days, so it's not a super fast thing. But once you start, you do the boiling for a couple hours, and then you let it dry. It takes overnight. Is this stable? Oh, once it's in the liquid form up here. You can refrigerate it in that form for about four days before it starts forming like beta sheets, before it starts trying to repolymerize. Um, you can do things like lyophilize it, which is a fancy word for freeze drying it. So you can freeze, freeze dry it and it'll last forever. Um, uh, but um, but I, when I make it, I didn't have lots of ideas I want to do with it, which is to the next part. like. Oh yeah, so this is me drinking wine while I'm doing it. So it's pretty safe. That's just like a food <laughs> safety issue. Like it's not a big, it's not very hazardous. Um, and that's the whole point is it should be all biocompatible. So this should be a very green, there shouldn't be a lot of waste. Um, it'd be awesome to do locally grown sourced <laughs> silk cocoons that you know. It'd be really fun. Anyway, so then you can get to products that are high tech, but we grew it on a tree. Um, so that's my that's where I'm working right now is how do I prototype materials, getting better at raw silk processing, and trying to come up with design applications 
places where we can use it, um, which I'm not that necessarily good at, but that's where a craft of like barn community might have lots of ideas or ways to engage in doing this. What would you, yep. on your other slide, at the end of that slide, what is it you've got? This, this stuff? Yeah, at the, at the very end. Which is that? What do you call that? Uh, there isn't a good name for it yet. Oh. It's fibroin, right? It's, it's this. <laughs> <laughs> She's got it. Uh, oh! <laughs> uh, so it's, it's basically, it's, it's, it's taking one component. The silk is actually made up of several different proteins and sugars and things. And what we're doing through the, through the different boiling processes is getting rid of those. And I think that, that, that's kind of where I screwed up, is I didn't boil it long enough to get rid yeah. of enough of the other stuff, and that's why it's all goopy. Because um, I didn't do a good enough. I wasn't, I was being quick. I, I was being it's that wine that did it. That and the wine <laughs> did not. Know. But that's the target of what you're trying to get through. Get to, and now you can start using that to and do then, other things. Yeah, so then okay. you can get to using this. And so it's, it's a liquid, and you can pour it in. Like, all I've done so far is, wherever that piece was, Pour it into a little petri dish, and it just <laughs> solidifies into a film. Um, it's okay. Oh, here it is. I got it. Uh, so I just poured it in a. You can. So we'll get. So yes. So what can we do here? We can extrude it, right? Um, theoretically, like if you have an extrusion printer, which yeah. How long would that last outside? I mean, obviously it's biodegradable. But how long would it last? So you can. Um, I don't. I don't know how to do this yet, but I know you can control. There's some way to control how long it lasts, um, and how long it lasts in water. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't get wet, it'll last a long time. If it starts getting wet, then it, it can start to get di 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 digested. You can control it. I've been experimenting with um, adding this thing called dopamine to it, which forms um, basically melanin, um, which should extend the life of it quite a bit. Um, um, so. There are ways to start to like think about different different ways of modifying that, but um, um, good question. So that that's a, a feature is, you know, a lot of plastics you make them and they put enough things in them so they last for thousands of years, but you're only going to use it for five minutes. It's kind of like, oh. whereas silk, right? It, it'll biodegrade. Things can eat it. It's not going to end up in the ocean floating around for a hundred years. Um, so yeah, that's where we are. So, uh, extrusion printing is something I'd love to figure out how to do. I, I like this particular picture because it looks like there's a fan there. And that would almost work for this kind of set setup if you had a little fan that would dry the silk as it came out, sort of. Um, lots of ideas for how to do, do that. And I know one lab is working on trying to do this, like make a silk printer, but it'd be fun to have, have something like that. Um, you can laser cut it. This is just a dress that they, they laser cut. But you can laser cut silk um, and get to make fun patterns out of it. You can make these sheets and then cut it out and do things with it. Um, I hear electro spinning is easy. Has anyone ever done it? Okay, I've never done it either. But something I want to try. Apparently, you just get like aluminum foil and a, a battery and the syringe of the stuff, and then it just like spins out down. And they're less than 800 nanometers. Yeah, I know, right? So you can start to do crazy things with this, and it doesn't seem terribly hard. Could you go into a little more detail? Yeah, so I've never done this. Um, this is what one of the labs did, and they were like, oh, that's so fun, that's so easy. We do it all the time. I'm like, okay. Um, so you just get a plate that you apply, uh, uh, that you ground, and then you get a battery, and you attach the battery to the syringe. So you suck up the protein in a in a, in a cartridge, and then you and you just start to press it a little bit, have the charge separation, and it'll pull the ground will pull that positive charge down, and it'll just create this like. And apparently, if you get a metal thing that you that, that also rolls, you can you can get like a thread of it that then you can get like a nano print. Um, and you end up with, well, you end up with fibroin fibers, which are different than silk. They're not quite as strong. They have some different things. But you can start to add things to it. Like you can start to add enzymes to it or electronic components to it. Or to like, then you can start to weave with that or make cloths out of that, which would be an interesting, sort of a, a long process to get there. But an interesting 
possibility. We make a very high thread count of delegates. Super high thread count. <laughs> Think how strong that little thing would be. <coughs> Blow it in theory, kind of it could be super strong. So, and then one geeky one that I really like is so the way that they make these molds is pretty in interesting. All they did is they took a stop sign and took the reflective, you know, the like you know how stop signs are, re are reflective on the white part. Um, they just took that and they poured the silk on it and then peeled it off, and it was this kind of holographic optical thing. And so silk does very interestingly, it molds on the nanoscale. Um, I guess other things do this, but because there's no heat, heat required, it's pretty easy. You can just kind of pour it on and like arrange it. You could almost do like a laser cut out of shape, pour, pour it in there on top of it and have this cool sort of like holographic thing. Could be a sticker, I don't know. Um, but what I really like is, um, is that it enables us to, to, to start maybe patterning nanoscale materials that we find in the natural world. Um, it enables us to work with life. So like, okay, so here are some project ideas that I just sort of am throwing out there. So this is like, how could you make a light out of silk? So one, one thing you could do, so this is, um, so fireflies, lightning bugs, fireflies, when they, uh, when they grow, when they when they glow, it's two. It's, it's an enzyme called luciferase, and luciferin is a. I think it's a protein. I'm not sure. Luciferin comes along, and then it, it when luciferase cuts it is when the light is produced, and it's one of those like most efficient lighting things you can get. But you can buy luciferase, and if you could put luciferase inside your silk here and then pour it down, then wherever you poured luciferin on, it would glow. And so I'd love at some point to be able to make like a Christmas light thing that contains these little like silk pods and you pump like water through it and the water, then you, when you spike the water with the luciferin, the lights would all glow. That would be kind of a fun sort of firefly light thing. No electric, well, except for the pump. Yeah. <laughs> or you could just blow it. Um, this is more sort of geeky, but you can start adding text, um, adding the silk to textiles in different ways. Um, so the back of leaves, if you've ever looked, any of the leaves around here, the tops of them are often the sheeting, so the water just will film and pour off, and the bottom's hydrophobic, which means the water just beads up. Um, and so you could potentially create those kinds, and the way that's done is on the nanoscale, on the leaf, they just have like little bumps. On, on the bottom that prevent the water from being able to like stick. And you could do that to clothing. Right now they, they use a highly toxic sort of fluorine molecule to get that bumpiness when you see water repellent stuff. Uh, but theoretically you could do that with silk when you just like pattern it uh, with like leaves. Here, how to do that. Um, there's ways to start, so bacteria, if you're, have you ever seen, um, there's some organisms out there like sharks that they'll sit at the bottom, you know, they'll swim around, but they don't get any barnacles on them. And it's not because they're swimming fast, it's because their skin has those micro bumps and the bacteria don't like to settle. And so um, uh, there is a company out there now that makes a, a mimic of shark skin mm -hmm. that now hospitals are using because it, it, it prevents the spread of um, bacteria that, you know, that are, that are resistant to antibiotics. But if we were better able to control the nanoscale, like through silk, <coughs> you could start to figure out how, um, how you could coat your phone so different bacteria would grow or not grow on it. Or there's all kinds of weird things you could start to get into when you start using these life-friendly. Uh, um, you could make like red tide sensors was another pro 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 project on the list. Because there are people now who make these, these sensors out of silk. Um, but you could just detect the enzymes that are present when the red tide, if you guys know, is this, uh, the dinoflagellates, they'll feed on excess nit nit nitrogen, they'll boom, and they'll produce these toxins, and if you eat them, you'll get sick, or in some cases die, and so we have those, those, those warnings. So these, these, you could put sensors that could immediately detect that kind of a uh, <coughs> And so, I guess, my question then was, how might you be a silksmith? If anybody wants to join me trying to figure out where this goes, that would be awesome.
Well, thanks, guys. So that was the that was the end of the formal talk piece. And now we can just do questions. Oh, anyone up for like projects?